So you should already know at a very fundamental level what DNS does because, well, this is one of the protocols that we talked about in our TCP IP section of the course. But we're going to be revisiting it in this section in much more detail because I want you to understand the fundamental aspects of it because this is a protocol that we use on a daily basis. So we already know from earlier in the course that DNS provides TCP IP name resolution services. And what is that? Well, that's the process of translating a domain name or a host name into the corresponding IP address and vice versa. So we see a domain name down here, domain name for me, which is instructoralton.com. That's the domain name for my website. If I know what the domain name is, but I want to find out what the IP address is, we can ask DNS to do name resolution and tell me what the corresponding IP address is. We can also ask DNS to do the exact opposite. If we know the IP address, then we can ask it to find out what the domain name is. Now, you'll notice that this is IPv4. However, we can also use this not only for IP version 4, we can also use this process for IP version 6 as well. So at a very fundamental level, that's what DNS does. So let's now take a look at what a fully qualified domain name is. So when we look at a domain name, it's composed of three different parts, a host name, a domain name, and a top level domain. So when you look at www.google.com, when you say www.google.com, that's not the domain name, that is the fully qualified domain name. And there's three different aspects of that domain name. So what you're gonna notice is that there is a top level domain. And so for example, for my website, www.instructoralton.com, the top level domain that I use is .com, but I don't have to use .com. I could go ahead and I could register, for example, a .net, I could register a .org, I could register multiple different ones if they're available. So you have to understand that there are multiple different types of top level domains, and these are just a couple of them. But .com is one example. Now, the domain name itself that you look to register is the domain name in the center, which is Instructor Alton. So when I want to register a domain name, I have to see if this domain name is available for the top level domain. And for example, in this instance, the .com top level domain. But if I wanted to see if .net was available or .org, I could register for that as well. Now, what is the host name part? Well, the host name part is where subdomains come into play. What this tells us for www, this tells us that this is associated with a website but it doesn't have to be www. What if I have a mail server or a file server or a print server? We could have mail.instructoralton.com, file.instructoralton.com, and etc. And we'll take a look at that right now because I want you to understand that when you register a domain name like instructoralton.com, well, you can create multiple different subdomains associated with it. And when we do this right here, we're creating a subdomain. So let's jump over to the next slide. So if you take a look at this very simple diagram that I created, which is a hierarchy of domain names, what you'll notice over here on the left is we have the top level of my domain name, instructoralton.com. But I created a www.instructoralton.com, a mail.instructoralton.com, and an hq.instructoralton.com. So we can say that this is associated with our web server. So we'll say just web right here. And for mail, this is associated with our email server. So we'll say email right here. And this one down here, hq.instructoralton.com, this is associated with our headquarter office. So we can write that down right there. But within our headquarter office, we may have multiple different devices within there. We may have a print server. So we may create a dedicated subdomain for a print server. We may call that printers.hq.instructoralton.com. We may have a dedicated file server. So we may call that fileserver.hq.instructoralton.com and et cetera. So we can create as many as we want. And I just wanted to show you that. And that's why I really wanted to talk about DNS in this section, focus on it, because whether you decide to work in networking or in some other aspect of IT, for those of you that are aspiring to work in IT, this is something that you're going to become familiar with. 
So that's the multiple different levels of fully qualified domain names. So to finish off this lecture, let's now take a look at DNS hierarchy. So when it comes to DNS servers, there's a hierarchy. And I want you to understand how this works because when you're sending out a query to a DNS server, if it doesn't know what that domain name is, it'll actually take you through a process. It'll send you up to root DNS servers that'll tell you where to go. And you'll start at the top and you'll go to the bottom. So let's assume that somebody wants to go to instructoroutland.com, but their local DNS server doesn't know the DNS information for my website and my associated domain name and any subdomains that I have. So what has to happen is that it needs to go to root DNS servers and root DNS servers are going to send it to the appropriate one. Remember for our top level domain, there's .com, .mil, .edu, .net, .org, .etc. And when I say .etc, there's other ones as well. So we know that my website is .com, so it'll send them to the .com top level DNS server, and that's gonna direct them to the appropriate, what is called a second level domain DNS server. In this example, we have Microsoft, but if they were going for my website, it would be instructoroutin.com, so in this example, it takes them to Microsoft.com. And let's say that the original query was for technet.microsoft.com, but they didn't know. So we start at the top, goes to .com. That's going to redirect them to the top level for Microsoft, which is in this level, that's actually going to be the second level domain DNS server. That's going to send them down to the technet.microsoft.com DNS server. And if there are more subdomains, it could continue to go down further and further. So it follows this process, this hierarchy starting at the top and going down. But if, for example, it knows where it is, let's say that it sends a query and it's using this DNS server by default and that already knows, then there's no need to go up to the top. So based upon how your network is set up and the DNS server that you're using, it may start at the top, it may start somewhere in the middle, it all really depends. At home, if you are utilizing Google's DNS servers, which a lot of people use, which is 8.8.8.8, .8 if you type in a domain name that you're not aware of, if Google doesn't know what it is, then it's going to go all the way up to the top and come back down. So I just want you to understand from a high-level perspective that there is this hierarchy, and we start at the root DNS servers, then we go to top level, then the second level, then the third level, and we can continue to go down further and further and further if we have more subdomains. So anyways, that's gonna conclude this lecture. If you have any questions, please let me know. If not, thanks for watching, and I'll see you at the next video. Take care. Well, I hope that you enjoyed today's video and you learned a lot from it. If you did, please give this video a thumbs up and also consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. Now, if you're interested in taking this full course or just learning more about it, check out the video description down below because I've included a link where you can learn more about the course and enroll into it if you'd like. So again, thanks for watching my video. I appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing you guys at the next video. Take care.